Hi, everyone. You're about to listen to a really interesting discussion that I had with Cory Doctorow about crypto and the left. But quickly, I just wanted to note a couple of things for context. Re-listening to our discussion, I felt that there were some times we were occasionally talking past each other a bit, but the likely reason for that was we had some actual technical difficulties during our call and the connection went in and out. So sometimes, at least for me, I had to assume some of the things that Corey was saying and respond to that because it was becoming cumbersome to keep asking him to repeat what he was saying, which would ruin the flow of the conversation. It's a little bit ironic since I do feel like talking past each other happens a lot in similar discussions over social media at least, but that is likely the reason it happened for us, at least to some extent. It was still a really insightful discussion and it was really nice hearing from him directly how exactly he felt about crypto, and I think our discussion showed that there is a lot of common ground even with some of the disagreements we may have. So I think you'll still enjoy it, whether you're a regular listener or maybe a new one that's coming on who's a little bit skeptical. And as usual, if you enjoy the discussion and would like me to continue to be able to do them, you can pitch into my efforts starting at $3 a month on patreon.com slash the blockchain socialist to help me out, which really helps since making this stuff isn't free in terms of money or time. I largely make free content like this interview to help spread the message that blockchain doesn't need to be used to further entrench capitalist exploitation if we put our efforts into it. But as a patron, you can also get access to exclusive content where I tackle more specific questions in a shorter podcast format. So if that message resonates with you or you would just like more of these types of discussions to happen, I hope you'll consider helping out. But yeah, here's the interview with Cory Doctorow. All right. Hello, everyone. You're listening to the Blockchain Socialist Podcast. And for today's interview, I have Corey Doctorow. He is a digital rights activist. He's uh, an author of both fiction and nonfiction, a lot of sci-fi works as well. Um, And he is a journalist. Uh, He's been involved in technology for a really long time. And you guys may have perhaps uh, read some of his work in the past, giving critiques about Web3 and about crypto and cryptocurrencies. And so I invited him uh, in one discussion over Twitter to see if he would come on. And he has agreed to be uh, to be a victim of uh, an interview. So I'm really excited to have you on, honestly. Uh, I think it will be a very, very interesting conversation. I'm sure there will be uh, some things that we will disagree and some things that we will uh, be surprised and maybe we do agree. I mean, I'm happy to do it. I have to say, um, if there is a kind of common pathology among people who really believe in crypto, it's that... Uh, if you say you don't believe in crypto, there is a there is an extent to which they are unwilling to contemplate the possibility that you understand what they're working on and just don't like it. And so right. I kind of hit up a, a wall on how many times I would have a repetitive conversation in which someone would explain to me that I didn't understand what I understood. Uh, but, uh, you know, certainly like most of those people didn't want to talk to me about left-wing politics and this stuff. So it was, hap- I'm happy to do it. This may be the last time I go on a podcast to talk about crypto because as much as I'm skeptical about crypto and I think that there's some really rotten stuff going on in the world related to crypto, I don't actually think it's that important, which may be an area where we disagree as well. But they're like, of all the things that I spend my time thinking about, crypto is not among the even top 10% in terms of significance. So it is an area that I'm, that a lot of people I care about really give a lot of importance to, which is kind of over indexed it in my attention, but all of the things being equal, I probably wouldn't have spent much time thinking about it. Sure. Yeah, I can, uh, I can absolutely believe that. I think, I mean, it is absolutely true. Like there are a lot of people who very, who feel very, very strongly about crypto and that it's sort of like the it is what is going to save the world uh, at some point or another uh, and that everyone sort of like needs to believe in it or get into it. And if you don't, then you're sort of like lost. Uh, of course, I have a, a, a much more <laughs> nuanced uh, view than that. Um, but maybe I think since this is like only 10% of what you say you really are focused on, I think one of the things that at least I have noticed um, is that you have talked a lot about things like DRM or digital rights management, you have been involved in various like encryption uh, related uh, sort of battles, political battles in the past. So I was wondering if you can maybe give a, a lowdown a bit about your career and like what what are the things that you are maybe like very worried about when it comes to technology and the Internet? So it, I, I, I would uh, start at the end and work my way back to the beginning, because one of the things that um, has happened over the last 20 years that I've worked on this stuff 
is that I've gone from some fairly specific issues to a much more generalized campaign. Uh, and that campaign is digital self-determination or technological self-determination, which when I look back on the things that animated my interest in technology, even in secondary school, even in elementary school, uh, when you know I was working on Apple II Pluses and uh, pet computers, that it was the fact that there was latent in technology the possibility of giving people and communities the power to decide how the technology around them would work that really animated my view. And so as against that, I started off as an, in, in earnest with activism on digital rights management. And the first wave of that was the idea that there were undue restrictions being mounted by digital rights management. You know, uh, infamously, Adobe's early digital rights management for books listed read this book aloud as a toggle that rights holders could turn on and off. And, you know, as someone who worked in bookstores and libraries and owns a lot of books and ended up writing a lot of books, it was pretty offensive to me, the idea that someone would get to tell me whether I could read my books aloud. Um, and as my understanding of what was going on deepened, the, the thing that became much more odious was that in order to enforce these restrictions, the idea was that we would redesign computers so they would run programs that users could neither see nor terminate that would observe the user at all times and interdict the user from doing certain activities that the shareholders, the manufacturer, dispreferred. And that this facility was just on its face unjust, right? That if it's your computer, you should be able to decide how it works, but also carried with it a, a kind of pathological danger which is that if we, if we assume that computers are going to become more widespread and more embedded, which is today a very non-controversial idea, but 20 years ago, I think a lot of people thought it was science fiction, um, then if we design those computers so that the people who use them can't inspect their running processes or terminate them or add new processes without oversight from a third party, that... Um, we would be sowing the seeds of some pretty horrendous failure modes that, you know, there would be the possibility of a correlated defect across multiple devices that would expose users to uh, malicious programs running in um, an area of privilege within the operating system or even below the operating system that by design the user could neither detect nor terminate and that that's bad enough when it's the laptop that you use to do your banking and correspond with the people you love and, um, you know, uh, uh, keep your family photos and sensitive information on. But it's really bad when it's, you know, your anti-lock braking system and your pacemaker and the thermostat that decides whether you're going to freeze or roast to death when the climate turns ugly. And um, that became kind of the next phase of the fight was this idea of ger protecting general purpose computing. Uh, and protecting the right of people to run programs on their computers, which is very co-terminal with the free software movement. Uh, I advocate for free software, but I'm not, it's not, again, not my primary goal. There are areas where I have some, I don't know what you call them, like some, some minor differences uh, of priority, if not a philosophy with the free software movement. Um, and, and that, in turn, that struggle over the right to run arbitrary code on your computer became, as the lens widened out, as the frame widened out, became a fight about uh, mo monopoly in technology markets and the role that, that these proprietary technologies play in uh, both creating and uh, expanding and maintaining uh, monopolies in technology markets by literally just getting to, le leaving dominant firms to decide who can compete with them and under what terms and uh, you know where those terms could be dictated by uh, a broad principle that is basically like on penalty of law you may not design a technology that enable that helps our users if it hurts our shareholders that that they could you know by mixing together patent and anti-circumvention and a bunch of other very abstruse areas of poorly understood law conjure up a new offense that uh, Jay Freeman from the, Sor from the um, 
uh, Sidia project he calls felony contempt of business model, that you, you could effectively harness the power of the state to literally criminalize people who adapted their technology to do things that benefited them if it came at the expense of the manufacturer. And that in turn led to just a wider debate and struggle and program about uh, demonopolization of the whole economy because uh, it is not unique in technology that it, that it is so concentrated. I think when economists talk about concentration in technology, they over-index on things like network effects. And they say, well, naturally, every time someone joins Facebook, that's a reason for another person to join Facebook. Of course, Facebook would have a winner-take-all network effect economy. But the flip side of that, the thing that they neglect is the that by design or by by default technology is very low switching cost there's no reason that you have to be a facebook user to communicate with other facebook users you could nominally leave facebook and use another service and it could send messages to those people either over an api or by having a bot that logs into facebook pretending to be you and exchanges messages with them while all of your activity takes place off the service uh and if it's true that network effects are what produce concentration in technology you would expect that other industries' concentration would be dictated by the degree to which they enjoy network effects, and that's absolutely not the case. It's not network effects that reduced all the professional wrestling in the world to one league, or all the eyeglasses in the world to one company, or all the beer in the world to, to two companies, uh, or all the finance in the world to four companies. It, it, it is a policy, an official policy of tolerating and even encouraging monopolies that arose in the 1970s with the Chicago School, and is a uh, until recently neglected area of the critique of neoliberalism that one of the things the Chicago School very explicitly did was argue that monopolies were efficient and that states should not take action to limit them. And uh, we've had 40 years of global antitrust neglect that has produced market concentration across many sectors. And I feel that because technology has this interoperability capability latent in it in a way that eyeglasses and other systems don't, that technology could be the vanguard of an anti-monopoly struggle, that because we have new ways, uh, unique sui generis remedies against concentration in digital technology, that we can deploy those to you know, seize the means of computation, to, to take control of the technology around us, and to set an example of what a pluralized, demonopolized industry can look like that matters to people's lives, and then we can make common cause with the people who are angry about monopoly in tennis shoes and monopoly in professional wrestling, monopoly in beer, monopoly in shipping, monopoly in banking, monopoly in hospital bed manufacture, and monopoly in powered wheelchair manufacture, that we're all fighting the same struggle, and that if technology can be the vanguard of that struggle and then create a, a broad-based cross-sectoral struggle that we will create a, a source of power that we can use to dismantle even these vast global corporate behemoths that have cornered so many of our important markets. Yeah, so I mean, that was well said. It, it, none of that I disagreed with. <laughs> I'm yeah, fully, sure. fully on board with all of that. I think, and a lot of what you said, I think, and we'll we, we can get into this we'll get into this in a little bit i think has a, of course a lot of yeah relation to what is happening in crypto or like what is uh, uh possible at least especially when it comes to this interoperability thing but first i really wanted to maybe dig a little bit deeper on um because we were talking about drm before and i think drm is something that to me it seems that w whenever people talk about for example NFTs or whatever, they sort of, they compare it to DRM or as, as it being like, as if it is DRM. And DRM is sort of like, it could be maybe arguably one of the first, like really, really big attempts of like, you know, property in a digital space and sort of like, how do you like put, put uh, property rights within a digital space? Um, DRM to me feels like one of those places in which that was like the explicit intent of doing, especially for I mean, intellectual property and, and, and all these other things. Um, but I guess when it comes to, so there's DRM, but then there's also, I'm curious your thought on the idea of, I guess, digital exclusivity or like exclusiveness. If we think about like the peer-to-peer -peer, like file sharing movement or something like that, where I remember, I mean, growing up, I like 
rarely, I don't think I ever paid for any music whenever at a certain age, once all that stuff was available. Um, and for some people that's like, oh great, you get free music all the time. This is like, you know, we're, this is digital communism almost. You can, everyone can get everything for free. Um, but at the same time, you know, there's the effect of, uh, and the extent of how bad or not that this stuff is. You had, uh, for example, a lot of artists were not able to get paid for a lot of their work or they had to change the way. Now most artists, I think, make most of their money via like live concerts or, or merchandise or, or things like that. Uh, sure, it depends per artist. Um, but yeah, but I'm curious your thoughts on like this relationship between DRM, like property in the digital world and like digital exclusivity. So I, 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 I want to roll back to the start of that question and and quibble with your characterization of what DRM was for, because I don't think it was about property in the sense that we normally think about it. Um, and I think that, you know, I don't want to get into the tedious debate that people have about whether the term intellectual property is a good term or not, but this is definitely an area where it misleads. Uh, the term intellectual property, if you don't know, was not a widely used term. It was really, it was coined in the 30s. It wasn't, I mean, there are historic examples where people have called things literary property, but it wasn't widely used. And in the 30s, intellectual property became a, a term, but it wasn't used in the industry. Instead, people talked about copyright, patent, trademark, trade secrecy, and these other realms. And they did so because each one had a completely different regime that was really distinct from the way that we think about property. You know, if you think about the the bedrock of like you know, Anglo-American property regimes, it's it's Blackstone on property, you know, it's uh, property is that which man enjoys uh, soul and despotic dominion over to the exclusion of all other people in the universe, right? This is, right. This is the thing that they teach you if you're a first year law student about what property means. And it's never been what copyright, patent, trademark, trade secret, none of those have ever been even remotely like this. And in fact, we used to call those different things. We used to call them regulatory monopolies, authors monopolies, creators monopolies, publishers monopolies. And of course, if you're the beneficiary of one of these monopolies, calling it a monopoly is not something you enjoy, right? Like it kind of chafes because if you if you feel like you need some adjustments to the contours of your monopoly and you go to your legislature and you say, the monopoly you gave me isn't expansive enough, expand my monopoly, people point and laugh. Right, but since the state religion of Anglo-American, uh, um, you know, liberal order is property rights, if you show up and you say my property rights are being trammeled, I'm being trespassed upon, then property becomes a thing that um, the state will intervene to to rescue. So with that, by way of background, DRM was a way of terminating property rights. Because under the historic regimes of copyright, if you were to buy one of my books, right? And so you go into a shop and you buy the book and, and, and you get it. There's a thing that, that's called the doctrine of exhaustion that kicks in. It's now your book. Copyright complicates that. You can't photocopy and distribute the book, but you can also, you can like photocopy the book and paste in a page that's falling apart. That's allowed. Even though copyright nominally restricts you from making duplications, it also has this fair use side that has all these uh, exceptions to those exclusive rights. But you could sell it, you could give it away, libraries could lend it out, you could start a library and lend it out. You know, people sometimes, especially these lawsuits about the Internet Archive, they have these debates about what's a library. Historically, there was no debate about what's a library. A library was a thing that called itself a library. That's all a library was. And so if you joined a learned society of engineers or the science fiction club at your university or um, the explorer society or uh, um, a cooking class, they would have a library and you could borrow the books and you didn't have to certify as a library with the International Federation of Library Associations to get the right to loan out books. So um, that property right was transferred to you, it was yours. And it was yours to do with what you would within the contours of copyright, which tried to balance the interests of the public and the interests of rights holders and their investors. What DRM does is it says, you're a licensor. You did, I never made a first sale. There was no exhaustion of my property interest in this work. You are the tenant of that work. And so, you know, when John Deere goes to farmers and says, the copyright in our software means that you can't repair your own 
tractor. What they mean is that you can't own a tractor. In fact, they went to the copyright office in 2017 and said, you cannot own a tractor, right? You can only be the tenant of that tractor. Maybe you own the husk of the tractor, but the soul of the tractor, the thing that makes it move, the software, can never be yours because we never sell it to you. We only license it to you. And the terms of that license dictate your use of it. And they are unilaterally handed down, not negotiated and so on. And so this is a regime in which property is the exclusive purview of an elite of you know transhuman colony organisms that we call limited liability corporations and where natural persons literally don't own property cannot own property at all full stop because everything that you buy that has some intellectual property interest in it can be characterized the transfer can be characterized as a license and the license can be terminated it can be uh, changed at will. You can say this license is subject to change at 30 days notice or whatever, you know, all of the, so your, your ownership disappears. You, there is no property in a DRM world except for the corporation and not for the user. And so the question of NFTs to me is orthogonal to this. It's like someone says, my house keeps catching fire. And they say, have you thought about a burglar alarm? Yeah. Burglar alarm might be great if my problem was burglars. But that's not my problem, right? My problem is is orthogonal to burglars. Burglars are bad. If I had a burglar problem, I'd be in the market for a burglar solution. But if every time I complain about my house catching fire, you tell me that I need a better burglar alarm, eventually we're not going to have anything to talk about. Right. But I guess my point was being more so that like, yeah, the so like indeed, like with DRM, you don't have right like the it's giving all the power to the to corporations as far as like what you can do with it and like to a large extent and you have like a very limited range of things that you're able to do with it within like a particular context but i guess when it comes to i was just mentioning nfts as something just because it uh, this te like similar things uh, pop up in like these types of conversations at least that i've had not necessarily with you but with like various critics online that uh, nfts are the reintroduction of digital property over the internet, just like I would argue, I guess, similar ways that DRM is sort of like, it's imposing property from corporations into our digital lives in particular ways. And that property in, you know, in very convoluted, like complicated ways and how property relations work, of course. Um, and so I was just mentioning NFTs as like a, something that like, does that fall into that or not? I understood that, but I don't think that that's what it does in any way, right? So. If we're talking about creative works, because I understand that people want to attach NFTs to, you know, cars or houses or whatever. But if there, you're, there, if you're there, talking there, about creative... There's no ends to dumb ideas about NFTs. That yeah, we can sure. But if we're talking about <laughs> NFTs in the sense that, like... I mean, I guess there's two senses that we can talk about NFTs in. The first one is, here is a URL. Here is the identity of one user. Here is the identity of another user. User A says, user B is connected to the URL. And then we socially interpret that to mean user A is the proprietor of whatever copyrighted work is at the URL and has transferred some interest to that user. That's, or, or, or acknowledges that user in respect of that work. And that's basically what Anil Dash was thinking of when he invented NFTs. It was a way for an artist who got a particularly pleasing compliment or a cash donation or some other benefit from an audience member to memorialize that, like by screwing a little plaque on the side of the building that says, uh, you know, Cory Doctorow acknowledges Fred Flintstone for his contribution to the book that's at this URL. Uh, and there's a problem with that which you know we've run up against there are actually a bunch of problems with that uh, which are all the problems of copyright itself and which nfts in no way solve and can never solve and are completely irrelevant to and again this is why i'm talking about burglar alarms and fires so the first problem is what's at the url is it going to be the same thing tomorrow or the next day or the next um, the second problem is does the person who minted the nft have, I don't want to use the word own because that's the wrong word in copyright, but have rights to that work that they can transfer. And how do they prove that? That's not a thing you can do on chain, right? That's a thing that you then have to go to a court or some other registry and or some oracle whose 
uh, betrayals are punished by civil authorities, right? Who you can sue for fraud, not on the blockchain, but in the courthouse if they make bad attestations. Uh, and and so that part needs to be resolved, right? Uh, and, and so those big problems, oh, and then there's the third problem, which is even if I'm the proprietor of this copyrighted work and I post a copy of it at a URL that's like book1.html, and I mint an NFT to you, what's to stop me from uploading that book and calling it book2.html and minting an NFT for someone else, right? Except for some contract that you and I make that we then get to enforce, again, not in chain, but in a, but in a uh, uh, you know, the Chancery Court of Delaware or something. So my understanding is that, of course, like anything that's related to copyright, that is a state legal issue that has nothing to do with what is on the blockchain at all unless some weird psycho future world where like the state is on the blockchain that's handling copyright i don't see that ever happening and of course i think the what you see or what i tend to see a lot in like arguments between like an nft shiller and like a right clicker is that they're both talking about they're both not even understanding what NFTs are when they're arguing with one another. You have on the one side, the NFT person saying like, this is my monkey, this is my picture of the monkey and like, you can't take it. Uh, nobody else, is, it's mine because it's on the blockchain and here's my address. And then the right clicker saying, obviously what I can do is right click, save it, make it my profile picture. And you know, there is no uh, like enforceable way to say like, no, you can't do that. Like the digital media is already freely available to whoever can take it. The so but like they think that they are like being transgressive in some way against their property or what they believe to be their property rights on the blockchain, while the other person believes is like making a incorrect like premise for their entire reason for why they're mad about like them right clicking their monkey. Whenever both like both of them are it's kind of like two two idiots kind of like arguing with each other to me and well and neither of them movie. understand copyright right it's like either it's like either. someone it's it's like if the house is on fire you have the one person who's arguing about why burglar alarms are the right answer and you have the other person who's arguing about why uh flood detectors are the right answer and then the house is still on fire right like neither they are both engaged with the wrong thing so i wrote a uh, uh something about this uh what did it what was it called it was like uh Crypto plus copyright equals clown poop uh, for medium uh, where w w and it was about the, the people who said you could own colors who were dumb. But it was also about the, the Spice Dow. It was but it was about the Spice Dow. And the thing about the Spice Dow is not only was the Spice Dow wrong, but so were the critics of the Spice Dow because the Spice yeah, Dow. Exactly. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, the Spice Dow assumed that you couldn't make a sexual essentially fan art, even commercial fan art unless you owned a book, which was like clearly wrong. And then the other people said, the critics said, you can never make commercial fan art uh, unless you have permission. Also totally wrong, right? There's a really important Supreme Court case about this, about a book called The Wind Done Gone, which was a remix of Gone with the Wind, told from the perspective of enslaved Africans. And uh, the Margaret Mitchell estate sued. And the author said, even though I am failing all four of the so-called fair use tests, which again is an area that nobody understands because they think those are the four tests that you have to pass and not four examples of tests that judges might apply but need not. Um, the, 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 even though it was using the whole work, even though it was a creative work and not a factual work, even though the purpose of the, the work, uh, of the new work um, was at odds to the first one, and even though it cut into the commercial market for the first work, it was intended to undermine the commercial market for the first work. In other words, it fails all of the things that if you, if you read the, the copyright statute as though it were a series of if-then statements, you would assume that the else at the end of it would be terminate um the judge said no, no no this is good like the supreme court said this is fine uh and so you know there are many circumstances in which spice dow could have made the jodorowsky movie of dune totally orthogonal to whether they went to an auction and, and bought a book and they were wrong and their critics were wrong and again like You've got the people arguing about whether you should have a, a burglar alarm and the people arguing about whether you should have a flood sensor and uh, the house is on fire. 
And they're just, they're, they're like, they're arguing about things that are irrelevant to the discussion. And so again, like when people say, oh, well, we, if there was some way that you could determine whether a URL was uh, the copyrighted work belonging to a person, you could uh, affirmatively identify that person, affirmatively identify a second person, you could then transfer that interest and commemorate it on a, in, an, in an immutable ledger, then you would solve a bunch of problems. It treats those first, like, if you could, if you could, if you could, as though they were a series of trivial problems. Those are the hard problems. Right, the part where you can just transfer the interest and move it around, and you know have pretty uh, uh, easy facilitation of market terms, that part's the easy part. It's 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 like if I'm, you know, trying to learn how to drive, and I I keep you know uh, grinding my gears, and you show up and you go like, you know, one of the things that makes changing your gears hard is if you're trying to address the radio at the same time. So here's a voice interface for the for your car stereo. Now you'll find it easy to change gears. It's like, well, maybe there's some benefit at the margins, but you have misunderstood what I'm trying to do here. So I, I just wanted to like push a little bit back against one just like small technical detail that NFTs don't need, like they don't necessarily are always something that is like a, a, a connection to a URL. Or that like it's it it's not something I think one of the things that I sometimes get I guess a little bit frustrated with is that sometimes the assumption is that NFTs are digital media or that NFTs are only like crypto art or it's only like a reference to a digital piece of media. But I think it's like a lot more I think the the issue is with the word in itself that it is so abstract and so vague on what it doesn't tell you what it does. It's just like one sort of property of like a particular uh digital function or, or object we can call it but like so to get back to to this like you have been around for a while since crypto is only like 10 percent of the amount of work that you do and then the other 90 percent being probably more pressing things probably related to drm i would assume um but at the same time crypto has become like very loud and it's become very politicized in the mainstream and it seems to me that there isn't like all that much consensus among a lot of technologists even but i was wondering like for you like have you ever is there anything similar in your career that you've seen something become so politicized so quickly in the technology space like this oh that's a good just question to well. just to add as well i at least my feeling is that the politicization seems to me that it's related to a feeling that property rights are being imposed on people who just want to use the internet like they would have before where they can get free media or or whatever else and that the feeling is that something like nfts for example is sort of an enclosure of their of their rights and like is like you know the enclosure of the commons type of situation happening people have described it well yeah i mean i think that that the copyright wars probably were as divisive because there were lots of technologists who were on either side of the copyright wars and I think there's a similar, there were similar concerns about enclosure uh, and enclosure at the network level, uh, enclosure at the hardware level and enclosure at the software level where you had this, this combination of um, laws, technologies and cartel formation that were aimed at uh, foundationally changing who could make things on the internet and what duties they would have having made those things. Um, also, I guess that, you know, to the extent that the free software open source, uh, movement and the split between free software and open source, uh, are distinct from the copyright wars. They also created a, a really significant split among, uh, technologists. To you then still like NFTs are not really a part of this, I don't know, argument or this, uh, I don't know the same, like, do they share the same thread? Not, not really. I mean, the the best argument I've heard about why people get so angry at NFTs was uh, I was arguing with someone who I think is probably now a former friend because every time I interact with them on Twitter, they're they're being quite uh, dismissive of me. But when I had written something about about cryptocurrency and been dogpiled by a bunch of cryptocurrency people, uh, many of whom were saying things like, "Are you Jewish?" Uh, you know, you know, Jewish bankers are running the world and we're threatening them with our new money. Um, he came along and said, uh, well, the reason they're so angry at you is you're threatening their uh, money. 
And, you know, that that was, you know, to the extent that people get really worked up about crypto, I don't think it's about technology. I think it's about people who uh, have believe themselves to be in possession of some wealthy things who in some in, uh, who in some kind of maybe non-explicit way understand that the value of those things depends on people believing them. And so anyone who says these aren't as valuable as you think you are isn't just disagreeing with you about whether they're valuable, but actually might make them not valuable as a consequence of that disagreement, right? That that uh, th there's a term actually for this. John Kenneth Galbraith coined it. It's the bezel. And a bezel is the magic interval in a confidence game where the confidence trickster has your money, but you don't yet realize that it's a confidence game. And in that moment, it's a kind of suspended moment of shared disbelief, mutual, mutual suspension of disbelief. You think that Bernie Madoff is going to give you 20% year on year ROI. You know, you, you've, you think you found the, the perpetual yield farm and they know <laughs> that they have taken that money and used it to buy ivory handled back scratchers. And um, both of you are very happy, right? And, if, if someone comes along and says, I think all of your money has been converted to ivory handle back scratchers and your yield farming is about to end, you get really, really, really angry. Uh, and, and you know, the, the only explanation anyone's ever given me why a disputation about whether NFTs are valuable or not should evince such a savage response, which again, like you say, you know, this is the, it's divisive in a way that is, um, hard to overstate and not divisive in the sense that people firmly disagree with you, but in the sense that if you say a thing that is critical of crypto, you will be dogpiled by people who, who threaten your life uh, and who, you know, throw anti-Semitic slurs at you and who accuse you of being a shill. Like, as I said at the start of this conversation, one of the weird things about arguing with people about crypto is not only that people don't believe that you understand it and still disagree, right? That there's just this like foundational idea that if you disagree, you must not understand it. But also that if you appear to understand it and still disagree, that someone must be paying you to disagree. Uh, and and again, like that is um, a thing that I really only encountered in arguing with like Scientologists. And sometimes, you know, when I when I argue about um, the Modi regime in India, I've, a couple of times I've had... Um, these these big kind of cyber militias descend on me uh who and and again like once they pivot from you don't know what's going on in india to someone is paying you to say mean things about india and there's never like an intermediate step where it's like i think you're wrong but at least i think you're sincerely wrong and that you understand it and that you and i have a foundationally different worldview uh and and so yeah go ahead well i was just gonna say i, I don't doubt at all that you would get comments like that i think that's yeah, like the, the, the crypto world does attract, I think, a lot of disenfranchised or people who feel they are disenfranchised at the very yeah, least. Yeah, sure. And who like take to the internet as like the place for them to, uh, I guess, release their, their steam or whatever. I mean, I think the same is true of um, like cyber partisans from in Modi's, uh, you know, Hindu nationalist army and Scientologists, right? You don't become a Scientologist because you're happy and things are going well in your life. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> um. In the other way, like I've also, like I also receive, for example, like it's it's one thing that I want to say that yes, I can totally see that happen, and I it does happen, and I'm like I'm sick of like really the the NFT uh, bam and like these types of like accounts that appear everywhere, and I get that as well a lot, and uh, it's not something that I even like want to defend, but I also get people who. Like if you if I mention the word NFT or, or cryptocurrency for a long time, especially I think in the circles that I'm in, just because I tend to be in more like left wing groups or, or online communities, that uh, there is like a there is also this reaction. Uh, like I guess the yeah the the reaction that I see is just to like make the point as earlier that it's become heavily politicized in in, in both directions. Um, sure, sure. But I mean, if you follow the idea that uh, that there is, I, I mean, I think that we're, I mean, we're, we're getting away from substantive things, but, but just to put a button on this, if, if you, 
understand that, for example, like there are certain people who get into certain belief systems who talk a certain way about it and react to other people in a certain way, that that is different from people. So if you're like in an MLM and every time someone talks about anything, you're like, well, have you thought about buying some tights from me? Or, you know, have you, have you thought about drinking chaga mushroom tea or whatever? The, yeah. the fact that people, whenever you bring up chaga mushroom tea, go, oh my God, is this an MLM pitch is fundamentally different from the people who are selling the Chaga tea wanting to make every discussion about Chaga tea and getting very angry when people don't. Because that there is a, it is it is not a, a symmetry, right? That It is not a symmetry that you have some people in your life who whenever you bring up an issue that's going on in your life, they say, have you thought about Scientology? And then whenever you talk about Scientology, people go, oh my God, are you a Scientologist? Those are not symmetrical. Those are Those are really different. Yeah, I mean, but it's it's something that, like, I agree with that. Um, I guess I wouldn't, like, yeah, I guess my question was just more about, like, uh, whether or not you felt it was about property rights or not. But I think, indeed, it is, as you're, like, sort of leading to, it is about also, like, the shilling and, like, the spam that I, I, I completely agree with. I, I well, so the shilling and the spam, whatever, right? That that is what it is. There's there's always shilling and spam. I remember when, um, you know, when when internet telephony came along, there were all kinds of scammy, like cut your long distance bill. I actually got sued by one of them uh, for making fun of his dumb thing and won, but you know it took like seven years, right? Uh, you know, so that's always there. I'm not talking about that, right? Like, so the people who are working on VoIP and SIP when you said, hey, VoIP connections are shitty, or I don't like talking on the phone, they didn't show up and go like, who's paying you to say that phones aren't good, right? Like that's that's fundamentally different from the people who are like, I can cut your long distance bill, right? They, that, that is a, it's a different kind of thing. Maybe we can go to the next question because um, sure. I think what would be really interesting, because I'm curious how you feel now, because I think it was last year, you gave a talk at Consensus 2021, no, it was, oh, did I? Yeah, no, you're right. I did. No. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. I was thinking of the 2019 thing in Prague, but yeah, no, you're right. I did a thing in 2021. It's all, time is a blur, but yes. <laughs> yeah, for us too. Anyway, yes. You gave a talk uh, at Consensus 21, Consensus 2021, which was like, you know, in front of all of these like crypto people, including probably a lot of crypto shillers, like a lot of crypto, uh, whatever else, to like send a particular message to them. For you now, like now it's been about a year since then. And now I, I'm not sure if like your, did your opinions change over the year because of like what you were observing or was there something that changed in crypto that you saw that like made you feel a particular type of way? No, I mean, I, I would s do that talk again and I'd say the same thing, which uh, is about the importance of, of actual decentralization. And again, like, in thinking about blockchainism and socialism, um, there are a lot of people, there are, there's a lot of contestation about the extent to which blockchain projects are decentralized. But the two st strongest claims I think you can make about, about blockchain projects uh, is that first, there used to be a small number of things that looked like banks. And now there are a lot of things that look like banks. And I think, I think that's an uncontroversial statement and it's a product of, of the blockchain. And then the next part is that the number of people who are very rich, right? The, the, the Gini coefficient of the people who use those banks is not markedly different and may in fact be worse than the Gini coefficient of people who use banks. And as someone who is, I don't know if I call myself a socialist or not, I was raised by Trotskyists. I'm definitely some kind of leftist. I'm not a liberal, I'm a leftist. Uh, as some as a leftist, I'm not particularly interested in how many bank-like things there are. I'm interested in how widely distributed wealth is, and uh, you know that's that's a thing that I. Uh, and so when when I stand up in front of an audience of people who say they care about the distribution of power, the the decentralization of power, that's the decentralization of power I'm going to talk about. And that was the theme of my talk at DevCon too, which is that if your service exists to skirt financial financial regulation, one of the primary beneficiaries of that is going to be the people 
who are undermining the rule of law and democratic accountability off the chain. And since all the important um, things, all the important benefits claimed for blockchain require that you live in a civilization of the rule of law, if the design of your project and the, your theory of human action and the outcome of your project weakens the rule of law by increasing wealth inequality, then you are not advancing the either decentralization or liberty. I mean, you're decentralizing the number of banks, which again is not important, right? The important thing to me is the decentralization of power. If there's five billionaires using a hundred banks, that is to me an indistinguishable outcome from five billionaires using one bank. Yeah, I, I think part of the, the problem that I find with the crypto world is, I mean, indeed, like it was sort of territorialized in the very beginning to be like this right wing libertarian ideal for for like money that is outside of the bank and outside of governments. And so like that was like very much the the thing that they wanted to do with it. And that's what like a lot of people tried to, I think, retrofit retrofit that image into blockchain systems wherever they could. And that causes like particular issues. I, I kind of feel that when it comes to like weakening the rule of law, I think we have to consider one or like the, the inequality thing. I don't know. I sometimes have a little bit of doubt if it's like, I mean, it's probably worse for sure. But I think when you're existing inside of the context of capitalism, that's sort of like an inevitable thing to happen. So like I've, I've never really went into being interested in blockchain because I thought it was going to like based on what it started off as that immediately it was going to like resolve inequality for me. Um, but then like I also felt that libertarians as they were describing it as like this like as like a, a decentralized bank or, or whatever you want to call it that there were like they weren't exactly describing the thing that they were actually doing correctly, if that makes sense. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense that there's, I mean, I often have noted a, a gap between the description of what's going on in blockchain land and what is actually going on. And the, it's fine to have aspirations beyond your existing point, but there's a, the difference between aspiration and delusion is whether you describe what's going on as um, what's happening in a transitional stage or whether you describe what's going on as um, uh, something that is really distinct from reality. Right. So, I mean, I, I would not describe it as like any of the ways that probably maybe the, the, the crypto shills that you've spoken to or whatever uh, have described it. But yeah, I, I think that my issue a lot of times with, or like the difficulty that I have with speaking to a lot of critics is that they sort of are criticizing the part that is uh it's similar to the nft thing where they're describing it poorly and not exactly what it is and then the critic is criticizing that thing and saying like oh you're wrong about this therefore it's a lie and a scam and therefore it is also useless and needs to be thrown in the trash yeah totally so you know what this is like this is like the people who who think that the problem with ad tech is that google secretly invented a mind control ray Right. And that and that the reason your uncle is a QAnon is that the mind control ray was invented to sell your nephew fidget spinners. But then Robert Mercer stole it and made your uncle a QAnon. The reality is your uncle was like a racist kook all along and material conditions. You know, let's just a socialist Agreed. here. Right. Agreed. The material <laughs> conditions uh, created a circumstance in which his most odious beliefs became most most salient to his life. Uh, and, and that's the that's the real like story of what's going on. And, you know, the, the people who say, well, if only we would pay for everything, right, if we could just put it all in the Apple App Store, right. then companies wouldn't wouldn't uh, treat you so badly anymore. It's I mean, it's errant nonsense. You know, right. if you want to see that paying for something doesn't make a company respect you, ask any farmer with a John Deere tractor. You spend $700,000 on a tractor and then John Deere says, hey, guess what? You can't fix your tractor yourself. In fact, you can. You can put the new part in it, but it won't run until you pay $200 and wait for a technician to come out and type an unlock code in your console because we need those $200, right? And, and you know, Apple says the same thing about fixing your own screen or, or getting your, your battery replaced by a third party. Um, you know, th the idea that if you're not paying for the product, you're the product is is nonsense you are the product unless there is some force maybe competition maybe regulation and maybe both 
that forces companies to treat you with respect. All other things being equal, the companies will treat you like a product whenever they can. Uh, and so, you know, I agree. And and so, you know, you have people who want to support the media industry who say, oh, well, the problem is that Google News is stealing content from the newspapers. And that's why our journalism sucks. And the reality is that like the fair use quotations, the snippets that Google puts up on the uh, uh, on its Google News site is the only part of Google's relationship with the news industry that's good. The part that's really bad is that they're part of a collusive duopoly that steals billions in advertising money from newspapers. And, you know, like getting fixated on whether or not your content is being stolen is a great way to distract you from whether or not your money is being stolen. And uh, I, I, I think that that is very similar, right? You have uh, you have um, uns unsophisticated critiques of, of Bitcoin and blockchain and, and cryptocurrencies and NFTs and DAOs that assume that the hucksters are telling the truth about how their, their technology works. And in fact, they're lying about it. And this is what I always say when I argue with people about surveillance capitalism. If your evidence for Google being really good at convincing people to do things with ads is that Google sells its ads to its customers by claiming that, you're, you've really made a giant mistake because Google lies about everything. And the idea that the only time they would tell the truth is when they were pitching their products is heartbreakingly naive. That's what I think part of that in relation is like, at least for me, is that by, by critiquing the poor definitions or like the poor way that you outline or framed what this new thing is, sort of it, it, it lies in the interests of the crypto industry to do that. That it sort of, in, it reinforces their framework in one way. And then it also like, it, it territorializes, it, it splits the market in a way that galvanizes who are their base, which for if, if you know, if you're into like the whole digital gold, like narrative or that like crypto is, is money, then like you're basically attracting all of these people who are predisposed to believing this narrative or like to, to buy into this narrative so that they can like separate you from your money. So Molly White did a really good essay on valuations in crypto and in which she urged us and, and also admitted to, to herself having done this of taking the valuation statements of crypto projects at face value. And you know, you exchanged a token for a dollar, there's a billion more of those tokens, therefore the token uh, the, the whole group of tokens is worth a billion dollars. It's obviously untrue. And this is how you get these eye popping numbers about a sure. hundred million dollars stolen and whatever. But that happens, that happens in, in like the normal and normal financial but not markets the, as but well. The, but there's liquidity in the normal financial market. Like people don't say that about, uh, uh, what's a good example, right? Like if you had, if you, if you sell your duct taped banana, for $100,000 at the Basel Art Fair, and then someone steals, or a million dollars at the Basel Art Fair, and then someone steals 100 bananas and 100 rolls of duct tape, no one says, oh, it's a $100 million heist, right? They, when people, when, when, when you steal, like my uncle runs a small business in Canada, and he was just subjected to um, uh, a, an executive account takeover where someone impersonated him to his bank and got a quarter million dollars. Mm. It's an actual quarter million dollars. Yeah, you know, like I understand that banks are doing fractional reserve and whatever, and a quarter million dollars. It's it's not it's not like the bank didn't actually lose a quarter million dollars. A quarter million dollar bills didn't waltz out of the bank. But there is liquidity to those bank balances that is not present in a shit coin. Right. Yeah. I mean, but you also have like I mean, you can all of the various tech stocks are all like I mean, extremely overvalued. Tesla. I mean, sure. the stock market in general, like it's a yeah, it's, yeah. It's, 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 the, they're the taking the same tactics as what already exists under capitalism. The stock market in general is pretty liquid uh, compared to compared to chick coins. Sure. L that means the scam will not last as long, <laughs> potentially. I mean, like the. Well, sure. And, you know, like and there are other factors involved. Right. So like one of the things that makes Tesla valuable is that uh, it entered the S&P 500. And now that it's in the S&P 500, all the asset managers have to maintain a portfolio of it because that is what the the index funds are, right? They're, they're shares in all of them. And so, you know, there's people who kind of front ran that, right? They, they anticipated the entry into the S&P 500 of the, of the stock. Then they bought the stock. The act of buying the stock drove up the stock price. 
that was a self-fulfilling prophecy. But again, that is a fundamentally different thing from saying, I sold one coin for a dollar, I have a million more, therefore I have a million dollars. It's just, it's it, like, there, it is it is its own form of dysfunction. It does not represent value in, to, in the real economy. The financial economy is not the real economy. We should fight the, the financial economy and fight the language of financialism. But we can still make gradations between the absurdity of claims about financial assets that are different. Like it is very different for the people who manage my 401k to send me a statement telling me how much the index funds that I put my retirement savings are worth and Bernie Madoff to send me that statement. Right, that they are really different propositions, and we can distinguish between them in a coherent way, w without conceding that a four hundred one k is a is a good way to plan for not starving to death when you get old. Right. I, it, yeah. I mean, and the four hundred one k is. I mean, that's something that you kind of, in uh, probably you know this day and age, is something that you need to have if you want to be able to retire in the first place. Uh, just how the how like the system is designed. Um, but one thing I wanted to get to is you mentioned, uh, before previously, you mentioned this, uh, quite a lot before is the idea of, uh, seizing the means of computation, uh, which I think is like a, of course, a, a, a great, a great phrase, but could you talk maybe a little bit about what this looks like for you? Cause I think there's for a lot of people, you know, crypto web three, whatever you want to call it is a way of seizing some form of the means of computation because they're able to like seize various parts of like what things that institutions do but now they can sort of do it for themselves or like that they can organize with one another using like digital tools to like you know especially when it comes to things like DAOs uh, and like yeah, a lot of DAOs I don't know if you are, like are quite aware but a lot of DAOs are really interested in like workers cooperatives and like wanting to work in that type of way which I mean, I would argue is like one way of, in a very, very small sense, owning the means of production. But I'm curious on, yeah, if you could explain a bit like what seizing the means of I'd production to you I, I like. would like to explain to explain it. And then I'd also like to talk about whether or not DAOs are, are the kind of thing that I'm thinking of. Sure, here. yeah. I, I, I have, I am skeptical of that proposition, but I'm willing to be educated on it. Uh, so the, the, um, the, there's something amazing about computers, right? I, do, I am a technology exceptionalist in this sense, that, that the Turing complete von Neumann machine that is the only computer we know how to make that can run every program we know how to write is a remarkable new thing in the world. We have had lots of general purpose things that tend to be simple, like wheels. And we've had lots of special purpose things that tend to be complicated, like, uh, you know, nuclear power plants. But we have not had general purpose complicated things before uh, and the primitives that arise out of the general purpose computer like cryptography and the ability to make secrets that are at least to a first approximation perfect um, general purpose end-to-end -end networks where to a first approximation any two parties can communicate using any protocol without any third party being inter able to intermediate them uh, and um, you know more recently and I think more complicatedly, something I'm less sanguine about, the uh, rise of um, of uh, uh, trusted computing in, uh, environments that allow you to make remote attestations so that mutually untrusted parties can uh, make reliable statements to one another about their computer's operating environment. I think all of those things in combination are like new things on the earth and that we can do some amazing things with them. So you know, you you talked earlier about the right wing origins or the libertarian origins of of cryptocurrency, and you know the internet has far more right wing origins than mere cryptocurrency. It was invented by like U.S. defense contractors as part of the project of uh, you know building a nuclear tipped U.S. empire uh, that spanned the globe and subjugated uh, all non American populations to American hegemony. Right, like. It's, it's hard to be more right-wing than that, right? Uh, and But I can articulate a way that we can use those primitives that arose out of that project in the project of human liberation from that kind of hegemony, right? So we can lower the coordination and communications costs, the discovery costs among partisans for a better world that we can then 
uh, you know, mobilize and coordinate with one another, right? I, I've written a bunch of novels about this. We don't have to get into detail, but it's it's not hard to imagine how a liberatory revolutionary movement could use this technology. And of course, there have been examples of this. You know, Stafford Beer teaming up with Salvador Allende to build CyberSyn is an example of a kind of utopian questing after a uh, a, a better digital future. But I've, I've yet to have someone explain to me how... Um, DAOs do that necessarily like I I, I'm I it feels like so now sorry I'm getting ahead of myself I'm getting into the why I don't think why I don't like DAOs or why I think DAOs are are not a good way to own the means of production but in terms of seizing the means of computation seizing the means of computation is asserting the right to reconfigure the digital computers that you use and or own so that they serve your interests and the interests of the people you are in community with as opposed to the interests of the people you are adverse to and um, we have a combination of technology and law that stands in the way of that. Primarily, there's this thicket of laws like anti-circumvention rules, like Section 12.1 of the DMCA that bans breaking DRM and makes it a five-year felony uh, to promulgate tools that bypass DRM. You have software patents. You have um, uh, exotic contract theories like tortious interference that make terms of service have the force of law. You have... Uh, um, Cybersecurity laws like the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act that have also been used to turn terms of service into uh, uh, legally binding documents with criminal sanctions for violating them. And seizing the means of computation is in part a technological project. It's saying we should modify our general purpose computers so that they serve us and not others. Right? That the problem with Facebook is not that your friends are there, it's that you don't get to decide how it works. And you and your friends don't get to decide how it works. And so the answer isn't let's build something that's not Facebook. The answer is let's change Facebook so that we can carve off a piece of it that we control that operates according to our norms and wishes. It's the difference between saying if you don't like it, leave and saying if you don't like it, grab it and fix it, make it better. Um, that that hacker ethic of uh, this, this doesn't work for me, so I'm going to modify it so it will work for me. And then I'm going to package up my mods as a script and I'm going to share it with anyone who wants to use it so that they can use it too. And so seizing the means of computation right now, that I think step one is reform the laws that block interoperability, that block user configuration of the things in their lives or, or toolsmith configuration on behalf of users to improve the things in their lives. Step, step two are, are more ambitious projects. It's what we build, what we actually do once we can modify those things. But we can't get to step two until we have step one, right? We have to seize the means and then we have to direct the means. In terms of DAOs, you know, I, I understand that there is a kind of a notional way to build a DAO in which the governance tokens are illiquid and therefore not speculative. But the, the template of DAOs, you know, generally, and the way that I've seen DAOs, including DAOs that are organized around providing public goods, uh, is that the governance tokens are are tradable assets and that the reason to acquire a governance token is to speculate with it in part or the reason the governance tokens are valuable and fund this is that you can speculate with it and if your means of production are is owned in part by speculators that is the literal opposite of you owning the means of production like the whole point of seizing the means of production is to eliminate speculators from the governance of the means of production. It's to organize production around the people who, who make it and the people who use the goods that are produced and cutting speculators out. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't disagree. I think, you know, the what you were mentioning earlier about, like, I think that there is, both can be seen as a hacker ethic, I feel like. You can either choose to seize what is there and fix it, or you can choose to uh, build some sort of alternative. Sure, that's right. Um, but I, I feel like that's like sometimes it's framed in a way that it's either or like either we, we, we take it and we fix it or we just need to like, you know, exit and like make our own new world. But I don't know, to me, I feel like that's just like not the right framework to look at it. And instead, it should be seen as like something that that happens in tandem with each other um, and whether or not like everyone agrees with both strategies is like less of the point. The point is more that you are doing both of those things. So essentially, like I, I a, fully a dual agree. Power, a we dual are, power. We're yeah. in vigorous agreement. Okay. So like, I think when it comes to DAOs, I, I don't disagree that there are a lot of bad examples of DAOs, I think. But my 
sort of reasoning behind this is that, I mean, because it comes from this right-wing libertarian point of view, which is like very, very unimaginative, it's very, very just like more free markets in, in various ways. And that, that, you know, if we speculate and make everything into a market, then we'll have, you know, efficient markets at one point or another. Of course, like I find that kind of like really ridiculous. And a lot of DAOs are sort of basically taking the model of corporations of like basically a token is just like a share in the company in one way or another as a sort of like the first mental model for how they're trying to create DAOs. Uh, but... I've, I've written about this before, and I don't know if you ever come across it, but I wrote a bit about like how DAOs and anarcho-syndicalism, I feel like, have a lot of similarities in the sense that there is a particular type of person who, are, who is interested in DAOs, usually. And I, there, when we're talking about decentralization in the organization, we're essentially talking about if, like, the decentralization of what is the most centralized aspect of everyone's life is that they have to go to work, they have to, you know, eight hours a day, uh, basically succumb themselves to a dictatorship in the business. And then, you know, they decide if they get paid or not. And then there are, of course, state regulations and, and, and labor laws, etc., that, like, provide support. But a lot of people want out of that, like, form of organization. I think decentralizing this centralized aspect of our lives, like, it there is already a pre there's a history to that already i mean it's it's the cooperative movement it's the the labor movement it's it's unions but it also could be daos the problem with using the word dao just like we're using the word nft is that it's extremely vague and it's extremely like it it means almost nothing it means it it means what it says in the most abstract sense possible and therefore like i cannot say i cannot tell you that like well this is what a dao is a dao looks like this because it looks like many different things because it's sort of being defined on the fly. And uh, the so the defining of it has been largely in like, okay, we're going to take tokens and this is going to be like a vote in the say of the DAO. And that's not like the kind of, that's not the type of DAO that I want to be a part of or like the one that I want to, to create necessarily or that I think is like the ideal state of things. Um, I think there are better examples out there. Um, there is... Uh, I mean, there is like, for example, Dorg. I spoke to the the founder of it. They run very similar to a to a worker cooperative. It's it's just a, a software collective that that builds a lot of these crypto protocols. And then as well, uh, my own project called Breadchain. We we run it as a cooperative, and we have no like speculative token about it. So some people will say like, oh, because you don't have like a token with your DAO, therefore you're not a DAO. But at the same time, other people would disagree with that. But the question is, I, th I think the thing that it, that uh, the, where I would disagree here is that with both proof of work and proof of stake and proof of storage, they're all grounded in the idea that um, we're not going to trust each other. We're going to nominate a system that will run the computation for us. Uh, that will use some form of mathematics to make that work. And all three of those, that system requires that, uh, or, or creates a, a regime in which people who are more wealthy have more control over the network. There's a fourth one, which yes. is the, the mobile coin style, um, you, trusted computing. And as I mentioned right. earlier, trusted computing is a thing I find really troubling, but, but, but although also exciting and interesting, but, but the, the, um, there is a counter solidaristic foundation in the idea of this. And there's also uh, a degree to which it is nonsense or at least incoherent because even if your computing substrate is something that you trust and, and it's been built on math and you found a way to make it egalitarian so that there's not um, loci of control that are oligarchic uh, or that can be organized around cartels so that it, it really is one person, one vote or a consensus driven organization and so on. Eventually, if you are going to do a thing in the world that isn't just money, that isn't money going to other, you know, money being transferred from one wallet to another or money like tokens being transferred from one wallet to another, you're going to have to nominate a human being to go and do a thing, right? If you're, if you're, you know, Spice Dow has to eventually send someone to Sotheby's to bid on a book. <laughs> Absolutely. Right? Yeah. 
I, I don't. And I, so, I don't, yeah, go, go ahead. The thing that I wonder about, the thing that no one's been able to explain to me is what is the environment in which you don't trust someone to run your server, but you do trust them to take all the money that you use the distributed server to organize and not run away with it, right? Who, who is the person who can be trusted with all of your money, but not with your server? But I think there's there's two we have I think you have to separate the problem that you're laying out. There is when you're talking about the consensus mechanism, we're talking about like the protocol layer of the blockchain itself. Uh, DAOs exist on the application layer. They're built like on top of this. So they're not really involved in the consensus mechanism. But I do agree like with the general critique about proof of work and proof of stake that it is like um, it is like a get rich you know, uh, rich people get richer, just like capitalism already is. But I would say that the reason that proof of work and proof of stake, like work, that reason that you can that, that it makes blockchains resilient, is kind of the fact that it, it complies with like the protocols of capitalism. Right? That 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 I don't disagree at all. And so like, so that's, that's, that's one layer. And that's sort of like based a lot on, I wouldn't say not necessarily not trust, but I would say in an environment of where you're like surrounded by enemies. Uh, there's a there's a better English word for that. I'm forgetting. I mean, why don't what like what is what is the difference between a DAO that doesn't have a token and uh, you know get standing up, like getting a, a Raspberry Pi scale server that can run the message board for you and your friends mm -hmm. and installing liquid liquid democracy on it. It just depends on what you want to do. Like, I'm not, I'm, I'm not going to tell you, like, you, whatever you, like, if you're going to organize anything, you need to make it a DAO. That's not what I'm going to say. Uh, it really depends on, of course, what you want to do. And that, like, my main thing or, like, my main message to people on the left is that, like, a DAO or, like, cryptocurrency or, or blockchains, whatever, like, just consider it a tool in your tool set of organizing and use it in the times and places where it's appropriate to do so. And there are many times where it's simply not appropriate to do so, and that's okay. Um, so it depends on what you want to do. I get that, but I just am, I keep waiting for the application in which it is better to build something on chain than it is to build elsewhere. I had a conversation with a friend of mine who's into this stuff and does a lot of community stuff with it. And he argued that, oh, there's a lot of tooling. Like you can just sort of download some stuff so it's easier to set up. I mean, but that's a bit circular. Yes. Right? No, I agree. With, I, I agree with that. But I think the the key argument for me is about resilience. It's about like being able to share. Well, it's not even. It's not even just. It's a couple of things actually. Resilience in that like you know that your technical infrastructure that facilitates your organization is going to continue to exist as long as the blockchain exists, in which there is like pretty high guarantees that it's going to continue. Uh, you want to hold like various digital assets together for one reason or another maybe you use it for funding yourself maybe you use it to pay for each other with uh, pay each other for something or to buy certain things but it's also because you do that because you want to be interoperable as well with the like broader like blockchain economy essentially like we can make a raspberry pi server and you know we can share our documents and we can you know keep it like privacy protected in various ways you can do that in tandem with like the technical infrastructure that you do for a DAO I think it's it's not like you're a DAO isn't in my opinion a, like a thing that you are specifically doing it is just like saying that you are using smart contracts or crypto protocols as like some sort of basis to handle some part of your organization so that you can keep track of the record of like what you are doing inside of that organization. I hear that. And, you know, I'm conscious of the fact that we're running out of time. I've got another meeting about to start. But, uh, you know, I, 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 by way of closing, I'll say that I just, I don't have your confidence that the blockchain will endure, that it's an enduring thing. Uh, and I, I also, um, I, I think that uh, there are lots of deliberative tools that, are reliable and robust uh, that don't require that um, it be hitched to this and that don't require interoperability with a project to um, dismantle the regulation of the finance sector. Like we have like back to the back to the earlier discussions we had about these excluded middles, like it, it is 
on the, it is absolutely true that the finance sector is badly regulated and oligarchic, but it is likewise true that removing the regulation will make it more oligarchic. Right. right. And that and that the answer to the bad regulation is good regulation. I don't want an unregulated finance sector. I am like I'll I'll stake that now, right? Like I'm a hundred percent against an unregulated finance sector. Right. I guess I would yeah, I mean ideally there would be maybe no finance sector in our socialist utopia. Sure, but I'll go along with that too. <laughs> or at least boring. Like if, if the finance sector returned to what it was, which is like it's what the fail sons of American Brahmins were sent to do because they weren't very bright. And they did it from like 10 to three every day and then went and played golf and they allocated, you know, sort of 15 to 25 percent of the capital that was allocated in our society was allocated by these fail sons. I mean, that's worse than just getting rid of them and, you know, I don't know, sending those people north for reeducation or something. But but it, it's still like it still would be infinitely preferable to what we have now. I would go back to the finance sector of the 1950s in a heartbeat. Yeah, it's 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 the 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 lesser of two worse options. Yeah, the least the least bad sure. option. Uh, I yeah. don't disagree with that. I guess maybe some of the doubts that I have is whether like good regulation is going to be able to happen. I mean, but also I I don't know. I guess just from my particular point of view, I'm not super concerned about finance, or that's not like like my highest priority. I, I hear you. I mean, I I. I really do have to go, but I'll say that I think good regulation is possible and we know it's possible because the roof hasn't fallen on in on you. And the reason your roof isn't isn't like the reason you're not sitting in a pile of rubble is someone figured out what the structural members that go over your ceiling uh, should be. And they did so in an evidence based way, even though there is upsides for many people in the chain between the person who broke ground on your foundation and, and you sitting in the building that you're sitting in now, who would have benefited from uh, la more lax regulation. That we don't have to be nihilists, right? We, we can, we can uh, create and agree on ways to do stuff that are good. We absolutely can. Sure. Yeah, no, I, I, I don't disagree with that. But yeah, I know you have to go. Thank you so much okay. for, for coming on. And I, I really uh, respect no that problem. you took the time. Hopefully, maybe one day when crypto is back on, your, on the menu, we can talk again. We can chat about it or some event or something. Thank you.